<laughs> well, welcome again to everybody here to uh, the uh, Mark 1 Symposium. Um, you notice that we've expanded our audience, right? and it may be because of the popularity of marriage to quit in the world at large. Marius, as it says on, on the uh, packet there, is the, is the senior lecturer in visual culture in the School of Art and Sound at the University of Portsmouth. And he's also, um, a lot of us might have seen recently the, the exhibition of the Brain, the Rock and Collection, which Marius was a senior consultant in that, and author of an essay in the splendid book that was published. I just think I'm going to put you off on a So I noticed something in this that your extracurricular, <laughs> both mounting sports and the triathlon, and, and which you have represented great Britain. Yeah. It does say. It does say. It does say. It does say, it does say <laughs> for his age group. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's very young. <laughs> which is still impressive. Anyway. Maris is this is the title of the team, they they can't go to the circus. You group creation in the performance. So I think that just let you get on with it. Thank you very much, Gary. And um, I love that performative introduction. Um, and uh, also I should say to, to Robert and, and, and also Andrew Carney for introducing me to this splendid group and the, the genuine friendship and company that we uh, enjoy, as well as uh, some very interesting talks here too, so I've got a lot to uh, measure up to. Well, I wanted in this talk to really just consider, and going back to, particularly in the light of some of the work I did for the Brains exhibition, to go back to a topic that's uh, quite uh, long in the tooth for me, but nevertheless uh, still of interest, which is the topic of my doctoral thesis on the early circus uh, in England uh, in the late 18th and early part of the 19th century. And, uh, I sort of framed my abstract, as it were, that I will consider how performances of trained animals, uh, sorry, trained humans and other animals in the early circus were framed, first in terms of enlightenment rationalism, and later to furnish romantic spectacles of sublime and untamed nature. This form of popular entertainment, which had its modern origins in 18th century London, uh, both reflected scientific trends and was credited to a surprising degree with helping to change prevailing attitudes towards animals. So what we're seeing here is arguably um, a production of a, of a more sympathetic sensibility towards animals, uh, which is partly grounded in experiments that were going on in brain science uh, at the time in the 17th and 18th centuries, as well as changing patterns of uh, middle class, developing middle class sensibilities, which uh, tended to uh, promote um, uh, sympathy towards animals um, as a sort of expression um, of good citizenship. So let's have a look at the origins of the circus. <coughs> Excuse me. So the, the modern circus has relatively little to do with uh, the ancient Roman circus, which was largely conducted, as you probably know, in an elongated oval, such as the Circus Maximus in Rome, and also reproduced throughout the empire, places like Colchester, for instance. Um, and uh, the modern circus uh, takes place in a ring of approximately 14 metres in diameter. It is really a product of the late 18th century. Uh, indeed, um, the kind of predecessor to the modern circus was beginning to become fashionable in the pleasure gardens and the race courses. Um, and the fairgrounds of England in particular, but also other European countries, thanks to the travelling exploits of English riding masters during the 1750s. And we have records, for instance, um, of uh, James Boswell writing about his enjoyment of this form of entertainment. It was seen by the standards of the time as being very um, daring uh, to be able to ride on horseback in this manner controlling up to three, as you can see in the background here, cantering horses, um, such as this example by Johnson. Uh, in fact, his name was Thomas Johnston. Um, and he was a kind of example of a new breed of equestrian who um, was from a plebeian background. He was a groom. 
but he developed extraordinary skills in, in horse riding and was able to retire to a sort of comfortable gentleman farmer's position uh, in Ireland as a result of his exploits uh, in the fairgrounds and um, of England uh, and also travelling throughout Europe. So this was a kind of movement uh, throughout the, during the period, it was a cultural export uh, of the English during this time. Now the accredited inventor of the modern circus um, was uh, this rather uh, jovial looking sort of bluff John Bull figure that we can see in the top left here, Philip Astley. And um, he was a cavalryman, a sergeant major in the um, 58th Regiment of Light Dragoons. And he was a kind of cavalry which was designed for fast harrying operations. The idea was that they were light and quick and extremely expert on their horses. Um, many of them, like him, were recruited from plebeian backgrounds, but they became extraordinarily adept at this traditional pursuit of the gentleman, that which had previously been dominated by noblemen. And many of the riding manuals that had been written in the 17th century, such as um, Cavendish's Guide to Horsemanship, or Cavendish's uh, Guide to Horsemanship, were by elites. But we have this kind of rising class, uh, and that is an important context to this. We can see in this, uh, obviously from a publication, perhaps something like uh, the, the Gentleman's Magazine, there are various figures, comparable figures, uh, of the time that may be significant. George Packwood, the shaving entrepreneur, sort of developed commercialised shaving, and Lord Rokeby, of course, of uh, the Rokeby Venus fame. Philip Astley uh, opened his own trek riding display. He was a huge originator, but what he was good at doing was commercialising his form of entertainment. And he opened this trick riding uh, display uh, at a, in a field called Hapenny Hatch, so-called, because um, of a toll booth uh, for a shortcut across the marshes of the then marshes of South London, uh, near the present site um, of the White Hart in Whittlesey Street uh, near Waterloo Station, and. Uh, this uh, became the, what is generally recognised as the first circus. The documents are fairly easily obtainable in newspapers of the time and posters and so on. Why is it the first circus? Well, obviously I've shown that there were examples of trick riding in circles and the importance of the horse cannot be um, underestimated, uh, overestimated, sorry. But the, uh, the key ingredient here was the presence, if you like, of a kind of mixed form of entertainment, the clown we can see here, the ringmaster dressed in a semi-military or hunting costume, somebody dancing on the back uh, of the horse, going around a rather large ring at this point, as we can see covered uh, premises. And uh, this was rather successful, it became, for Astley as well, uh, a major export, including to France, where there was um, a growth of what was known as Anglomanie during this period as kind of fashionable interest in English culture amongst the um, monarchs of the, and the aristocracy of the Ancien Regime. In 1784 he um, displayed, amongst others, to Queen Marie Antoinette at uh, Versailles and uh, Fontainebleau as well. So this was exported. One of the acts uh, that he became known for was relatively simple, but it was really a demonstration of his prowess of training horses. And this was known um, as the prologue on the death of the horse. And Astley was not a man of words. Uh, he was a bluff character known for his kind of gruff personality. But nevertheless, um, he would occasionally rise to attempt poetry in such expressions as he would announce at this particular act. Um, this was to show, quote, how brutes by heaven were designed to be in full subjection to mankind. And then he referred to a famous general in the recent Seven Years' War with the French and others, and uh, he bellowed, rise, young Bill, and be a little handy to serve that warlike hero, Granby, referring to the Marquis of Granby, who was a famous general. And of course then the horse would briskly stand up. There were other examples of these kind of trained animals on display, even to the extent that the animals would attempt to become or would, ape, would be anthropomorphized in this way that we can see rather dimly in this rather deep, nevertheless quite detailed uh, woodcut handbill showing the so-called dancing dogs. And they would perform various acts. There would be a hanging of a deserter here. They would storm a fort. Uh, there would be a dog dressed as a judge. All these rather kind of cutesy uh, acts, which, according to some cultural theorists, suggest um, the idea of carnival, which is the idea of the world upside down, so animals taking on 
uh, human guise and reversing normal hierarchies uh, of uh, nature. So this sort of thing became famous and popular, and uh, so much so that in the early 1780s, uh, an unemployed actor from Covent Garden uh, named Charles Dibdin, uh, the elder, uh, he had sons by the same name, was um, fell upon hard times. He met up with some, speculat uh, some speculators, some venture capitalists, and they opened up the so-called Royal Circus in St. George's Fields, uh, which was quite close by to Astley's, just about a mile to the east. Um, at St George's Circus. This was an improving area of the South Bank of London. It previously a kind of wilderness of crime, marshiness and squalor was being improved by these various kind of neoclassicizing enterprises, the obelisks you can see at the circus um, here. Circus meaning, of course, the, uh, the, round, uh, the, the roundabout, essentially. And, but it was also applied to this building here, this rather kind of fine uh, Palladian uh, facade that you can see. And inside the circus, you had both a stage and a ring for the performances here. So the stage would pre present various pantomimes and topical dramas, musicals, essentially. And uh, we would also have the, this, the circle for the, um, for the riding uh, display, which Dibdin himself regarded as a rather lowly business. He said it was full of uh, blackguards. But nevertheless, uh, it proved fairly popular, this hybrid form of entertainment. What you can see here is the crowd in this uh, wonderful Rowlandson caricature, the, um, the, uh, the architecture from the microcosm of London. It's kind of a coffee table book of the time, uh, showing the, the civilizing sites of London was by Pugin, the um, Augustus Welby Pugin, the architect of the House of Commons's, um, the House of Parliament's father. Um, he and, and Rowlandson's caricatures of the kind of robustious crowd here, they're all crowding inside the circle because that's uh, what they did with the half, they had a so-called half price crowd. They would come in late and they could stand on the, on the stage for, to watch the stuff going on in the circle and then when there was things on stage they do in today. You can just about make out Harlequin Columbine here and these kind of various fantasy uh, scenery, scenery that we have as well. This, however, was regarded as a threat to the so-called patent theatres, and the legal context of all this is quite important. The so-called patent theatres, Drury Lane and Covent Garden um, in the West End of Westminster, were legally um, allowed under the censorship regime of the time to present the so-called legitimate drama, that which involved prose dialogue. The so-called illegitimate theatre could only sing or do kind of dumb show. And this dumb show included, in this rather unflattering caricature entitled The Downfall of Taste and Genius or The World as It Goes, we have um, here the kind of various uh, pillars of civilization, fame, charity, justice, and so on, um, and uh, chasing the various muses here, painting, poetry, Shakespeare's plays are being trodden on, um, by these various, this horde of carnivalesque figures here, General Jakku, the rope dancing monkey who appeared at um, Astley's, the learned pig, it says on his collar there, <laughs> Chilomy, the English bulldog. Here we have uh, the dancing dogs, uh, we have a rabbit so, uh, playing a drum, and we have various figures, probably Philip Astley and his rather handsome son, who uh, Horace Walpole rather fancied. Um, on the back of um, the horse there. So this kind of um, example of a kind of knocking copy in visual form um, was certainly around and there were great legal battles that took place in order for the circus to establish itself, all sorts of shenanigans and corruption in a true Hanoverian fashion. Nevertheless, uh, it survived and went on to comparative uh, fame. And um, we have uh, the uh, the great enthusiasm of the public and the kind of diverse nature of the audience perhaps suggested uh, by this uh, Dickensian crowd here, 1823, nice, um, a nice aquatint, showing the famous equestrian Andrew Ducrow, probably the most famous um, circus performer of the 19th century. Um, and uh, he was known for his kind of, uh, his extraordinary ability to uh, both act in this mime and dumb show in these very exoticizing roles. Here we have the unparalleled feat of Monsieur de Croix, who wasn't actually um, French, but he aped the French identity, uh, in the character of the wild Indian hunter on two rapid courses in the circle of the Royal Amphitheatre, which was at Astley's establishment after Astley had died and had passed on to de Croix. Um, and um, so you can see here him running around in a way that almost turned the horses 
there was a great appreciation of the horses, their fleetness, their ethereal qualities. One of his horses, wrote a, a journalist at the time, a short-tailed bay, is a beautiful creature, a beast for Perseus. He is pure air and fire, and the dull elements of the earth and water never appear in him. And uh, this sort of romanticizing uh, understanding of uh, the, uh, the horses, um, which were the main attractions at Astley's, becomes embellished with the sorts of narratives. We have the dramatization of Lord Byron's famously bloodthirsty poem, Mazeppa, which takes us to the, um, the steppes of Poland and, and, and Russia. Uh, and, and the her hero in this story, um, who dares to above, love above his station, is punished for his pains by being lashed naked to the back of the fiery, untamed steed and sent galloping off to his presumed death. Uh, but of course, he manages to survive his ordeal, which was represented on the stage by a series of runners and ramps and all sorts of pyrotechnic special effects um, at the time, and uh, survive his ordeal and uh, win, raise an army and come back and conquer his oppressor in this kind of final showdown. Really a kind of predecessor in some respects of the modern um, action movie, which thrilled audiences, as you can see from this suggestion here. Um, Kit in the gallery at Astley's, uh, this kind of Dickensian audience. Dickens, of course, wrote about um, Astley's both in his journalism and in his novels such as The Old uh, Curiosity Shop. Um, and he was very much for him associated with childhood nostalgia. He, um, he wrote of the, uh, the vague smell of um, horses suggestive of coming wonders. Uh, so the, the whole atmosphere is suggested by that uh, romantic, uh, exciting scenario. But if we just go back to, you may be wondering what happened to enlightenment in all this. And uh, if we go back to some of the earlier um, framing uh, of the narrative of the, of the circus, we, um, we have this uh, idea that the, the circus was a, a civilizing institution, which was partly uh, to do with the way that it had to be presented to the public. Um, and especially to the authorities as a kind of safe form of popular entertainment. This was a period of increasing hostility towards uh, traditional forms of unruly popular entertainment, fairgrounds, football, which were, pop were associated in the rising middle class mind with um, crime, with disorder, with prostitution, with vice, and, um, and uh, lack of industry. So what we have is the circus trying to present itself as something modern, something that would be uh, appropriate to uh, a civilizing, enlightened age, and also something which was supportive of the hierarchy of husbandry, of, hus of, of, of um, animals, and of course of property, uh, and including the land uh, on which they uh, depended. And uh, this is perhaps well illustrated by the kind of Stubbs uh, classic images of these splendid new uh, breeds of Arabian racing stallions, racing horses that we can see from this particular example, Luster, held by uh, a groom uh, at the time. And Astley affected to sort of um, cultivate and support this. He wrote a, a probably ra largely plagiarized uh, riding manual, The Modern Riding Master of 1775, and he wrote in it, um, the obedience of the horse is to be valued. Therefore, if somewhat tractable the first morning, take him into the stable and caress him. For observe this as a golden rule. Mad men and mad horses never will agree together. So the calm of a good horse reflected on its own owner. And um, this made for a kind of whole system and a hierarchy and very fine gradations of um, horse statuses, horse types, and also the vehicles that were used to transport them. And so an 18th century audience seeing this image, which unfortunately is a bit blurry, from the National Gallery, and you can go and see it tomorrow if you like, it's on display at present, would, um, I think, have been able to read all sorts of social status narratives, fine gradations of style, um, it, rather in the way that uh, you know Jeremy Clarkson might be able to read um, the uh, the uh, kind of st make a story out of simple things like cut different differing cars, and there was quite a lot of mention in the various circus playbills about the different statuses of the vehicles that might be shown, or the different types of horses that might be shown, and very clearly aligned with uh, the particular characters that were brought out in the circus dramatization. So, you know, particular characters, personalities, and so on, a mirroring of gradation of human <coughs> status in 
the in-horse society, if you like. What we, of course, also begin to see in this period, this rather wonderful whistle jacket uh, by Stubbs also, um, is perhaps a more aestheticized, um, incipiently romantic appreciation uh, of the horse. Almost in this, uh, and this is again the kind of quintessential, quintessential uh, almost febrile, capricious Arabian uh, horse, uh, uh, a stallion, almost feminine with its flowing locks and sort of coy look over its uh, shoulder in this way. And um, Stubbs, of course, is well known also for his tremendous uh, work on horse anatomy, the dissections uh, that are shown and drawn in very great detail. Many of those are stored at the um, Yale Center for British Art. But from the sublime to the ridiculous, we not only have the association of the horse with property and status, but there are also the, the articulation of anxieties about the... Um, the use of the horse uh, and the assumption of the horse by uh, the lower orders. Um, so, you know, here is the kind of the horse as social faux pas. Uh, that's an urban legend which was quickly adopted uh, by the circus as one of its acts. The urban legend of a tailor, um, and tailors were a famously uppity radical group who had uh, very slippery identities because they dealt with uh, fine clothing, they could easily assume, they could dissemble uh, that kind of clothing. And they were associated with political radicalism. Here is a tailor going off to vote for John Wilkes at the Brentford election. And uh, the horse, very uh, wisely, according to the circus audience, uh, refuses to let him do that and ends up throwing him off. And uh, this is shown in this uh, handbill here with the woodcut, uh, which was even exported uh, to France as kind of example, you know, the wiser horse. And there was all sorts of political metaphors uh, developed from this particular idea. Um, and, uh, it, and used by journalists as well. So if, if someone couldn't support an act uh, by the party leader, they would kind of throw them off like a horse riding to Brentford. But we not only have the comic, we also merge into, as it were, the sublime, the terrible. So the horse begins to be, uh, during this period, and this is in um, conjunction with experiments going on in neuroscience and following the work of for instance, of, of Boyle and um, of Thomas Willis in Oxford in the 17th century, a growing awareness of uh, animals um, as sympathetic creatures, not simply programmed to behave in ways that are divinely ordained, but uh, as part of a, a, a nature, if you like, red in tooth and claw, and indeed possessing a nervous system. And, uh, and uh, so this kind of idea is also uh, suggested by Stubbs in his horse devoured by a lion. And uh, the kind of mental, the emotional state of the animals involved mirrored, of course, by the landscape with this kind of rather agitated vegetation and uh, rather sort of uh, um, uh, rococo, if you like, looking uh, rocks in this case. Um, so the horse, and this is taken perhaps to a height by Jacquot in, um, for instance, the horse frightened by lightning. I was what went into the, I was looking at this the other day, and always useful to listen to audiences around you. Um, and someone obviously who had a knowledge of horses said, yes, horses really do that, do that when they're um, afraid. They sort of go onto their back legs, ready to spring off, uh, but at the same time rest in this kind of frozen uh, state. And uh, Jericho study horses at Versailles and um, other way, um, in other places. And we begin to see here this romantic understanding, which was exploited by the circus, of the horse as really a register, um, a means for de depicting states of mind, and indeed of reading them. They were quintessentially expressive creatures, suitable for depicting ranges of emotions and social states. And there is almost this kind of anthropomorphization of emotion and the turning of horses, because they could be so trained and manipulated into actors uh, in their own right in the drama of the time. And of course, then you also have the eliding of certain social and racial categories, ethnic categories, um, to the, uh, the various states of horses. And certain others, other peoples were in the kind of imperial panoply were regarded as having a kind of natural affinity with horses. Arabs with the Arab horses, for instance, fighting in a stable. So the natural violent state of nature, perhaps uh, suggested here. And also kind of sexual frissons going on as well. Rosa Bonheur, 
uh, famously uh, would venture into stables, uh, and this was thought, uh, you know, a, a, a somewhat uh, outre thing to do. Um, with, uh, to wear trousers to enable her to sort of move more easily uh, in that environment. So this, all this kind of seething horse flesh that we see suggested in the horse fair of 1854 has also become uh, a point of interest, uh, this particular painting for uh, feminist uh, art history scholars. And it's, I don't think it's unreasonable to point to painting as a kind of indicative medium that Martin Meisel in his fantastic book, Realizations, um, which is, looks at the interconnections between the narrative, dramatic, and pictorial arts of the time, suggests that there was, in this period, a, a fundamentally pictorial mentality that took hold of literature, that took hold of the stage, um, and it was very much to do with the demonstration, making moral statements through gesture at this time. The, uh, in particular, um, the the circus and the stage would have moments of tableau in which paintings would be uh, suggested or even directly quoted. Uh, perhaps a rather lame quote in this example of the Royal Circus, a, a horse uh, with fireworks firing off it, um, also showing its kind of calmness on the fire, if you like. But the romantic image of the horse was very much uh, incipient uh, in this period and generalized. So it was not only an elite form such as uh, David's paintings, but also you know, in the cheapest of uh, penny circuses in Greenwich, such as this on the Royal Circus in Bridge Street, uh, Greenwich. So, we're again coming back to enlightenment in this, um, and uh, where is the science? Well, the science was probably superficial, it was probably largely rhetorical. It was nevertheless, there were kind of elements of uh, the circus being uh, aligned with modernization. And uh, this is something that Astley was very keen to cultivate as a kind of philanthropic individual, an entrepreneur of this former wilderness of South London. Uh, he wasn't just adding to the crime and squalor and dissolution of the theatre, traditional dissolution of the theatre world. He was attempting uh, to uh, bring science, scientific experiments, partly through his cosmopolitan associations with Paris in the uh, late period of the Ancien Regime, 1784. So this is the same year as uh, the Montgolfier brothers, or I think the year after, uh, within, certainly within months of the Montgolfier brothers in Paris launching their hot air balloon. He would do so um, in, uh, in, uh, on the south bank of London, uh, Mr. Astley, three curious balloons. So this is his uh, extraordinary house he built, which is called Hercules Hall. You've still got, I think, Hercules Row uh, down there um, in, uh, near Waterloo Station, named after this. Um, Hercules, of course, was his idea that the power of Hercules was what the trained circus performer could display. And um, here we have the balloon being launched here. So this is uh, an image of progress, and even such things as the Conjuring Acts were cloaked, uh, I'm sorry about the quality of this slide, uh, a rather old photocopy, but here is his kind of magic conjuring manual with the little uh, speaking horse, the horse that could apparently speak, saying, you know, in this rather pompous Latin way, inspicia et judica, inspect and judge. And um, even things like uh, the freak, so called freaks that he displayed, um, a short man here, uh, Minier Vibrand Lorcas, a ce celebrated man in miniature from Zelst in West Friesland, 60 years of age. Uh, the presentation is of a kind of respectable Dutch a bourgeois with his uh, normally proportioned wife, uh, and the narrative here says that he had children of uh, average stature and so on. Uh, uh, whereas, on the other hand, you have this kind of oscillation between you know, the normalizing and the exotic mode, which carries on into the freak shows of the 20th century. We have these supposed monstrous crores, which were, in fact, um, three individuals from the Italian Arts who apparently, because of ID levels in the local water supply, developed large goiters. So, where does this bring us, um, and uh, where is Descartes uh, in all this? Well, um, much of the... Uh, so, I'm just coming back to... It. Yeah, so, the... Well, how did it change attitudes? I mean, the lot of the circus was... Um, clearly something that was regarded as light entertainment, uh, and that is clear. Nevertheless, there were concerns not only about the cruelty of the training methods, and real concerns and some parliamentary inquiries in the 1820s when anti-cruelty legislation 
started to be um, enacted uh, as to how the, uh, the circus achieved its, um, its, its, uh, its tricks. But also, there was some relatively serious uh, comment on you know, what all this meant for our understanding of uh, human-animal relations and the relative uh, position of uh, animals and uh, humans in the brute in creation. And for instance, in 1788, which was the year after Astley had shown his wonderful pig, the learned pig, who would pretend to read from cards um, arrayed on the floor, um, on the stage. And uh, in 1788, uh, somebody called Sarah Trimmer, who was a ch sort of moralistic children's writer, said uh, she quoted, she credited this with kind of real influence in the kind of gradual dethronement of man as this specially uh, sensible creature. She said, I have, said the lady who was present, quoting someone, been for a long time accustomed to consider animals as mere machines, actuated by the unerring hand of providence, to do those things which are necessary for the preservation of themselves and their offspring. But the sight of the learned pig, which has lately been shown in London, has deranged these ideas, and I know not what to think. So we uh, finish with perhaps the idea of the world upside down, uh, the animals uh, assuming human form, which, uh, albeit uh, not terribly serious, still proved a source of inspiration and of interest to poets of the time, such as, for instance, Wordsworth, who in his, um, in his famous, uh, um, in his famous um, poem, Bartholomew Fair, uh, from the prelude, says, uh, he talks about the horse of knowledge and the learned pig, all jumbled up together to compose a parliament of monsters. This for him was disorder. Whereas um, for one of Astley's higher poets who wrote in the press, he wrote, he said, um, what cannot man, the wonder of whose hand, the well-earned plaudits of the night command, when brutes the work of reason seem to find, glow into thought and nearly change their kind, when the fleet courser proves obedient skill and moves conformant to the master's will, thus from, every, from instruction can it perfection flow, and every grace of polished pleasure flow, sorry, show. Admiring circles ever justly draw and raise even brutes beyond the brutal law. So hackneyed and, and rather traditional circus acts were, at this kind of revolutionary moment in the 1790s, reinterpreted in a semi-serious way. And they became optimistic signs that modern man could transcend by a kind of secular, enlightened discipline, the fallen state that had always appeared natural. Thank you.